Everybody, welcome back to Fear of a Flat Planet, an in-depth look behind the scenes and in front of the scenes at the Canadian Snowball team. Today we've got Mr. Derek Livingston in the house. D Live, DK Living. Not sure what you're going by these days. How are we doing? Pretty good, man. Pretty good. Almost done my quarantine. Gonna get back out into the real world soon and hang out with everybody. Seems to be a bit of a theme with everyone I'm talking to at the moment. Uh, stuck in quarantine. How long do you have to do in quarantine? Uh, we have to do 14 days when we come back to Canada from, you know, anywhere, whether it's the States or Europe or anywhere. So, um, I think Friday, so tomorrow is my last day and then I'm free. I'm a free man. I get to go hang out with my dog and my girlfriend and actually go right. enjoy the outdoors. So it's full on, like, cause I know in some countries it's like, you can go and be in a, in a household, but so you're yeah. like, you're just like solitary. Well, I'm doing it solitary because uh, my girlfriend works for Aritzia and her their policy is like, I can't be in the house with her. We don't have enough space. If, uh, if we had like a multi-room, multi-bathroom house, then we could make it work. But we just have a small two-bedroom, single bath, so it doesn't work out for us. So I have to, I'm borrowing a friend's place. She's staying with her boyfriend and then yeah. I give it back on, uh, on the weekend get the biohazard suits and spray down everything. Yeah, yeah, seriously, I'm gonna have to wipe this place like top to bottom. She's a bit of, uh, I wouldn't say a hypochondriac, but she's definitely very aware of COVID. So I just gotta make sure everything's all tidy and clean when, before I leave. Fair enough, uh, it might be a sign of things to come this season if you're, if you're getting back on the road, let's see how we go. Dude, the crazy thing is like, the way the season's looking, we're going to be either in the States or in Europe for most of the year. And if I have to quarantine every time I come back to Canada in between events and training camps and whatnot, like it just makes sense for me to spend my whole season on the road. And the way the States is looking right now, I don't necessarily want to spend my whole time in the States because, uh, you know, the COVID cases are pretty high there and it doesn't seem like, I mean, people are living there, you know, we got friends in the States, but uh, it's just, you know, I don't know, it seems a little bit safer in Whistler where you're a little bit further away from the big cities and stuff. Yeah, fair enough. And that's where you're, are you based in Whistler full time? I mean, yeah, pretty much. Longer. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I'd say, yeah, I, I live here for most of the year. And then obviously there's no half pipe here. So we got to go to Calgary a lot for training. Man, that hits deeper. Huh? Whistler without a pipe. How, how many years yeah. has it been? Well, I mean, like they have a pipe, it's just not full sized, you know, like they, they usually build like a 16 footer and it's fun to like mess around in, but you're not going to go like chuck double corks or try any of your big tricks in there. It's more just for fun. But yeah, it's been, I don't know, I'd say probably four or five years without a 22. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough. Huh? Like I, I was talking to some other friends about this, like the, 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 the pipe scene is shrinking in some ways. Like the, there's less access to these kind of pipes and like, almost the accessibility for your, your, your sort of average kid to be like, right, that's, I want to go and do what those guys are doing. Like, how do I do that? If you don't grow up in Lax or, or Calgary or, you know, Japan or somewhere where they like full on go into that, it's tough to, to, to step into the pipe world these days. It feels like. Yeah, for sure. I mean, here in Canada, most of the people who are coming up on the younger side are all living in Calgary and they're growing up with that half pipe. Right. Um, I'm sure it's similar in a lot of places, but like you look at countries like Germany and stuff, they have to travel to Lax to go ride a good pipe or sometimes they'll go to Austria if they have a good pipe built, but like, you know, so it, I think we are kind of like super fortunate in Canada and North America to have so many half pipes when we were growing up. And now we're kind of like seeing it across the board where everybody's kind of cutting budgets you know Breckenridge lost their half pipe when due tour stopped hosting or they stopped hosting the due tour so um you know it's, it's just a change change of times you know we'll see what happens hopefully more resorts will jump on the train of like building mini pipes so that it can at least introduce kids at a young age to ride transition more because you don't see a ton of transition in parks these days no um, it's not it's not it's not it's not a common thing anymore no no like and it's cool to see that you know, contests like uh, US Open and uh, other big events are putting in transition features into slope style. So hopefully 
transition features will stick around and they'll become a little bit more popular and maybe people will jump on the half pipe train again. Am I right in saying at the moment you are the only Canadian in the, in the top tier for pipe riding? Uh, yeah, I guess so. I guess you could say that currently. Uh, we yeah. had another younger kid making his way up, but he, uh, he had some injuries last season that took him out for a while. So yeah. I think he'll, I mean, he'll be coming back. That's Sean Fair. He'll, uh, oh, that's right. Yeah. 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 He, he made it to, uh, uh, Lax Open semifinals a couple times and uh, U.S. Open a couple times. So That's right, yeah, uh, yeah, I think he's going to be pushing. And then we got another young kid who just learned his first double cork, Liam Gill, and okay. he's uh, he's 16 years old. So I think he's got a, a good future. So we got some younger kids coming up. But yeah, I'd say, I mean, I'm kind of the veteran on the team. So I mean, it, it's it, it seems like there's a bit of an imbalance in the way that the Canadian team not not I'm talking about logistics. Just you've got like maybe the heaviest squad on the slope style, big airs, oh, yeah. and then there's sort of there's there's kind of you and Sean, and then obviously these kids coming up. But there's so what what was your road to choose pipe? Because I've seen I've seen your your slope stuff. Like yeah. you could have quite easily gone down that road. What what was it that made you stick to pipe and and you know? well and you know very successfully ride in the pipe as you have done honestly the the biggest thing that's made me stop competing in slope style was double corks like i was at the point where i was still getting by with doing flat tens and like nines and i didn't have like a big bag of tricks and then so i was i was like making finals at a couple um slope style world cups and whatnot but it's I can see where you go with this. The shit out of me. <laughs> I can see where you go with this, and it doesn't sound like it makes a lot of sense. Okay. <laughs> Doubles are stopping you competing in slope, but you yeah. got what? You got at least one double in your pipe runs, which seems so much more dangerous. Yeah. Well, was, I think the double train in the half pipe came a little later. Okay. So it was like a little. You could play it a little bit safer in the half pipe for a little bit longer. Um, and I don't know. I just. I don't know. Half pipe is pretty awesome. The weightlessness you feel like when you like blast yeah. like a 15, 20 foot air, like that's pretty awesome. You don't really get that feeling hitting a jump kind of if you hit a hit maybe, but yeah. it's still not the same. Um, that you drop the word safer though now, because whenever I go and, and I'm fortunate enough to work at these top level half pipe events, every single hit of any rider, I don't care if it's the girls or the guys, every single time, obviously I'm focusing because I'm doing the commentary often, but I'm absolutely terrified. Like, you know, yeah. and it just seemed like you said that it seemed safer in the pipe. I think half pipe snowboarding at the level it is now is maybe certainly top three if it isn't the number one. It's the, the most gnarly sport in the world, one of the most dangerous. Like you think the sustained risk from top to bottom, the athletic, the physical attributes that you have to hold, like the, the uh, like, and the margin for error is, error is so small. That that's the biggest thing I think is the margin for error. If you pop too much, you're landing flat. If you don't pop enough, kind of on the deck. But that's like yeah, like when, anything. Yeah, when I was younger, I definitely didn't think about that as much. It was more like okay, I got to go upside down twice. I don't even go upside down once too often. So like, what, how am I going to go twice? And then it took, yeah, I guess it took me a couple more years to get into the double corks in the pipe. But I don't know, just the way I spin, like I've tried double corks on jumps and like back double 10 seems the one that would be the easiest for me. And it just doesn't work in my head for some reason. Right. Like I can't picture it. I've tried a couple and I just get lost. And maybe that's just cause I don't spend enough time jumping, but I don't know. It just seemed to click. I could like see all the tricks in the half pipe, like how it's going to look, like what I'm going to be looking at just cause I guess I spent more time riding pipe than I did riding jumps. What about on the, on the sidelines of the Canadian team on the half pipe? Because I'm, you know, I'm familiar with most of the slope guys as well. Do you are you uh, do you have access to all the same uh, facilities and you know mental coaches, all the physical training, everything like this on the same? Do you you, do you need to use all that stuff, or do you just sort of? Go yeah, off and there's like we have access to most of all that stuff. Like we we work out in the same gym, we work with the same trainers and stuff. Um, the guys who are based in Calgary, like the younger kids, they have their own set up going on over there um i live in whistler with the slope style guys kind of so we all use the same stuff there we um we do have access to like nutritionists and mental training coaches and um i don't use that stuff super often i don't want to like necessarily rely on that kind of stuff but i do see the benefit in using it so there's a couple things 
like when I was coming back from an injury last season, uh, talked with a mental coach about like, cause I've never really taken, I don't know, like four months off snowboarding from an injury and having to go back into contests like that. So, uh, that was just like a big part of where I was trying to like, just prepare. Cause like I was jumping straight into X games last season, oh, coming yeah, straight off right. an injury. Yeah. That's right. I forgot about that. Yeah. So that, that was a big one. It's like, I, it was my first X games invite. Didn't want to turn it down. Yeah. Wanted to show up, wanted to like, go like ride my heart out, you know, and, uh, coming right off that injury was kind of scary to be honest. So, yeah. Uh, I don't know. She, she helped me out a lot and, uh, I think I did really well. I mean, I was still kind of hurting a little bit, but I was still able to ride and pretty much put all my tricks down. So it's, uh, yeah, some of, some of the slams that you guys take in the, in the pipe and then seeing guys go, guys or girls go back up and do their runs again. I'm, I'm always blown away, but like, if you take a lipper and then bounce down and then you're able to go back up, I like must be superhuman. It, it seems, you know, dude, it's, it's pretty gnarly. I mean, I've definitely like, I've had some bad slams, but I feel like guys like Sean and guys like Pat have taken the gnarliest ones where they're like, their face is looking over the deck and they smack their chin. Ooh. Like there's that one video of Sean losing his helmet at X games and stuff. Like, I don't know how he went back up and competed after that. Like he must've been concussed, you know, like I probably didn't that know. Was so gnarly. <laughs> yeah. No, but like even, even in slope style, like those guys take gnarly slams too. You know, they kind of more ragdoll sometimes when they yeah like catch an edge on the landing or something, you know, I feel like there's, there's just more there's with slope. Like, you know, you've got that big long landing, like the, the, I feel like when they go down, they go down because it, but they you're kind of more able to deal with it somehow. It's more like the ones that catch the guys in the slope, I think is like the toe edge catches on rails or, or like things like that, where they're just fully yeah. not prepared. You can see a lot of them cat like in the air these days. Oh, this has gone a bit wrong, and they'll just sort of skid out. Whereas in the pipe, it just doesn't seem like that's vaguely possible. Yeah, well, I mean, there's all at every event. There's always someone who's going down. You know, that's someone's pushing it hard, and it happens. It's like an inevitable part of the sport. So, but yeah, like in, in pipe, it can be a little bit gnarlier. I've seen some crazy crashes that have taken people out, but you know, you just gotta like not think about that. And it's so always I, a bummer when it happens, you know? Oh, man, that's the thing as well. I think, I think as well, because you, because like on the slope, sometimes people are, they're gone, you know, like it could be the third jump and you're watching it on a small screen in the rider's area and, or maybe on the big screen, but you're, you're not like right there, but the pipe, you can see the whole thing. Yeah, dude. It's so impressive. Like it's always the event that I tell people who've never, Oh, well, really want to come and check out with like your family or friends, you know, who've never seen snowboarding really apart from on the TV. It was like, oh, you know, if I wanted to go and watch a snowboard event, what should I do? What should I go and see? And I'm always like, if you can get to a top level pipe finals, just just go up there, stand on the deck, and like you will you will never forget that experience. Yeah, no kidding. It like I mean, contests like Lax Open, US Open, X Games, there's always huge crowds, and that's like one of the best part about competing in half pipe. You're doing an air, you're doing your trick, and you hear people cheering and like banging cowbells or whatever banging the banners and stuff and they're like right underneath you they're like 15 feet away from you and you can hear them cheering it's crazy I, more than 15 feet Derek I've seen you ride it's more like <laughs> oh um, yeah can still... you, do you do you hear them that's that's actually a question I wanted to ask because I feel like some people like you could you could stand next to them with a megaphone just be like what's up and they're just like oh you said something and then and yeah. like, can you hear that in a run do you hear like people banging the banners and things like vaguely on the drop in, I'm hearing it. But as soon as I'm like winding up for my first trick, like I don't hear anything, but sometimes you hear a little bit of like cheering, but it's like very faint. Cause you're so focused on what you're doing that you're not really paying attention to all this other stuff that can distract you. I don't know. It's, it's not like something you intentionally do. It's just something your brain does on its own to get you into, I guess, like flow state or whatever. Yeah. So what's been your, where's your favorite place to ride? Let's say, let's say two, 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 a question of two parts. Where's your favorite place to ride? Just riding, like okay. there's no comp on. You, there's a pipe, we'll do, like maybe there's a pipe, maybe there's not. Favorite place to ride, but also where's your favorite place to compete? Um, oh, that's that's so tough. I gotta have give you a couple answers. So my favorite place to ride, I'm gonna say Whistler. We're here, like 
mountain's awesome. I like kind of know most of the cook nooks and crannies, but there's still so much to explore. And like, you just roll into the park. You have all your friends there. It doesn't matter what day it is. Someone's there to ride with and powder. We get like decent powder here all year long. So, um, I'd say this is my favorite place. My second favorite place to ride is in Switzerland. Um, Lax, the mountain's awesome. And every time we've been there, we've gotten dumped on. You know? <laughs> it's uncanny, isn't it? Every year. Dude, it's insane. Awesome. Contest day is always like, like qualifiers is always socked in. And then finals is always clear. And it's like, you get to ride practice. Sometimes you do, sometimes you just go ride pow. So um, Lax is definitely one of my favorite places. And that pipe is just like so unique. It's so steep, so big. And you just feel like you can generate so much speed and go so high there. So that's definitely my favorite half pipe, but the vibe at the, I mean, Lax is getting to that point where they're getting more crowds and more crowds and bigger. It's becoming more of a show. And like the vibe is becoming a lot more like the U S open, but I'd say the U S open is my favorite spot. You know, it's summer. It, I mean, sorry, it's not summer. It's spring. It's usually warm. You can get like soft pipes and like sun's out tons of people around. And it's like the last event of the season. So everyone's like, all right, we're done this. And then we're partying or like, we're just having a good time, you know? So that's definitely yeah. my favorite contest. Oh, for sure. And so, I mean, I remember for the first time I ever heard, Oh, the pipes nice and icy. It's going to be great. I remember hearing that for the first time and kind of, turning around and going, what's this person talking about? Surely you want like a, a softer pipe. But I guess nowadays, like the amount of forces you're putting in, you, what's the perfect consistency of snow for you for the pipe? So the way I like to describe it is if the snow is like chalky, that's good because you can like set your edge in and it's grippy. Okay. But if it's icy, it's harder to set your edge. and You're going to be oh, slipping yeah. a little bit if you're not on point. So I wouldn't say an icy pipe is good, but a solid pipe, like a firm pipe is, yeah. is great. If you have like what, what you see at the U S open a lot is that one wall gets soft cause it gets beat by the sun. And then you start losing the, the snap at the lip. So people start decking out on that one hit, like yeah. near the bottom, you know, second or last hit on the right, like look or lookers left, riders, right. It always, people start decking out because you lose the lip there. Um, and like soft pipes are super fun for learning in because you're not afraid to fall if it's soft and slushy, you know, spring pipe, but like it makes it harder because you get huge ruts and stuff. So if you can have like an, a firm pipe you, that you can trust the wall, that's when, you know, you can just send anything you want and you're going to be landing in the right spot. Yeah. Makes sense. Like that kind of like dry kind of Colorado like, yeah. like, like when they're you know, Aspen or in, you're in Breck or somewhere and you get those perfect groomers and then like the pipes in that, like you said, yeah. solid, but yeah, you can get an edge in, but you're not going to lose an edge, but it's, yeah, it's like, crispy. It's, it's got texture. Oh. Yeah. Crispy and texture. That's what you want when you're riding a pipe. Mm, okay. Um, how about your setup for the pipe? Do you, do you ride the same boards? Um, do you ride, do you have different um, setups for riding park and pipe or? Well, mainly we try to keep our boards pretty free of dings and stuff. We don't want like scratches in the edge or necks or anything in the base. So usually I have like dedicated pipe boards, but uh, the board I use in the pipe is still a board I'll go hit jumps on. It's just like stiff, responsive, you know, you're, you're going to land a little bit tail heavy and you're still going to be able to ride out of it without slipping out. Um, and like, you know, I don't ride rails super often, but I still can ride using a pipe board but you know some a little bit more softer is is definitely a little bit more playful and fun in the park and obviously you have your pow board right yeah of course you gotta have yeah. that as a backup like on almost any trip you kind of go on just just in case right yeah that's it oh, so do you throw it in every time most of the time i do like if i'm going to switzerland like oh. in, in january bringing it for sure yeah you know if uh we're going i don't know like didn't bring it on this last trip but like we, you know, the powder we were getting was like you did you got good. you got some power we got some good power there was like days where it was like 40 centimeters overnight and then they had to do some bombing so a lot of it got kind of compacted from the wind and whatnot too but there's definitely some really good days and it stuck around and that's it dude that's the thing about riding in october is that you get winter conditions up on top right instead of like going up early in like, like if you're going summer riding, you're getting up there and it's icy as heck. And then like 
there's like maybe an hour window where it's like perfectly soft and then it gets too slushy. Right. Mm -hmm. But up there you're, you're riding winter conditions and you could get pow. So like, I don't know. I think October's, you can get warm weather. It's like you get a mix of everything, but it's more wintry. And I think that's awesome. With such a long break, do you, are you able to come in? Cause I, I one, you're frothing to get back on your board. You're probably like, ah, snowboarding, but yeah. are you able to come into it with the sort of specific goal is look, I, you know, I've got to take it easy. Remember how this works. You know, we can, we can leave the new stuff till later. Let's just, you know, get back into it. Are you, are you able to do that? Or are you kind of like, do you have a coach that's saying, calm down. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm more the reserve type, you know, like I'll take my time getting back into things. And sometimes it's like, I take a little bit too much time. I have too much fun just doing straight errors and small stuff. <laughs> but, uh, then like, it's the end of the day. I'm like, I didn't even do... Yeah, exactly. Like sometimes I got to push myself to go do tricks when I just want to have a little bit of fun. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so th like definitely on this trip, I just wanted to like take it a little bit more slow the first week or two and just slowly get into the tricks and just like really work on uh like the f thing i find is like writing and figuring out your technique is a big part um of riding half pipe like you need to know how to ride the pipe properly if you're like a little bit too front foot heavy you're going to be pushing off the wall you're going to be dumping speed it's like uh just like if you're pumping rollers or if you're pumping a burn you got to kind of sit back a little bit and let your your weight go through the transition and up into the air so if you're a little front foot heavy you're going to like be pushing against the wall and falling forward versus like letting your board come up the wall. So I'll, that's like a bad habit I have of being a little bit too front foot heavy. So I have to work on that quite a bit. Is that over eagerness? Do you think, do you think you're like too, like too focused? Oh, I got to do this. And then off you go. Like do you just sort of sit back and let it flow a bit, or is it just a pure sort of uh, glitch in the, in the, in the matrix of technique? Yeah, I, I think a lot of it, because I see it with a lot of people, is like people get a little too tense and they're trying to anticipate the wall coming or the lip coming. And so they like, they hunker down and like try to resist a little bit. But like you said, if you kind of just relax a little bit more, stand up a little bit and get that weight onto your back foot, one, you're putting in a lot of less effort, two, you're going to go bigger and everything's going to feel easier. So yeah. that's that's how I find it. But like, especially when you're trying to wind up for a big trick, you kind of want to be tense. You don't want to be relaxed too much because you want to like unload with this huge power. So it's like this fine line of like figuring out the balance there. Yeah. Okay. I, I didn't really, I, that's interesting to hear. Cause I've, I mean, like you can see when someone's gone too early quite often, you know, but like, I didn't really, I hadn't really heard that between the balance between the, the front foot and the back foot so much. That's yeah. Yeah. And, and going early, that's all about, not being patient, being a little over eager, obviously. Um, like if you look at Ayumu, he's got like impeccable timing, always right off the back foot. He, dude, he's, he, his arms don't move. It's just all in his shoulders. It's crazy. Yeah. Watching, watching Ayumu and Sean White, especially like watching those, like how perfect they are every time into the, into the transition. Like those, those guys are something else. Yeah, it's insane. That, That's something I haven't quite figured out, but working on it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. you got a damn pretty... Don't, don't sell yourself short there, Derek. you got a pretty... Yeah. Well, well, like, you know, everyone rides their own style, too. So, like, I'm not going to look like Ayumi when I'm riding, but, you know, there's still, like, little things that you can definitely improve on all the time. So that's kind of, like, my goal is to go out there and figure something out, something out every day, whether it's a new trick, a new way to, you know, hold your edge. Not a new way, but, like just fine tuning everything, you know, and working on something every day. It's obviously, I mean, there's, there's that, that five ringed event that has meant to be happening in Beijing, uh, winter after next. Um, is that, is that the goal now? Is that where you're, are you already, you know, eyes on the prize or is it, uh, you know, a bit early doors for that? Well, um, <clears throat> the Olympic qualifiers, am I allowed to say that word right now? <laughs> that one? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, the qualifiers are, they start this season. So every world cup leading up to 2022 counts. Do you, um, do you personally, do you, or maybe not personally, maybe it's part of the, the, the sort of team, team sort of, uh, I don't want to reveal your secrets, of course, Derek, but, um, 
Do you go into it as with a kind of a strategy like, or like I've got to do enough to get there, and then when I get there, it's all in. You just sort of build, or are you kind of someone who's like, you know what, I want to be at my peak, so I'm gonna I'm gonna ride like each event is like, boom, I want to win this, and move, you know, take it into the into the main event like that. How do you how do you function? Yeah, in the in the past, I've been like, get a run down get your points, move on to the next. And I'm, but I was always fighting to get into finals. I was never like, there's just something about my consistency and maybe my amplitude that wasn't getting me the points I needed to get it, make it into a final. So I was always struggling just to stay in the ranking. Okay. Get to qualify. So, um, but then in the last couple of years, I've gotten some podiums and stuff and I've been making finals more consistently. So I think my, my plan is going to change and I kind of want to go in and try and like, you know, I want to be going into every event, making finals and trying to get on the podium, okay. you know? And if you're making finals, you're pretty golden, you know, yeah. as long as yeah. you're there all the time. Yeah. Okay. Are we good? And so you mentioned, you mentioned some of the, 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 the up and comers as well. How deep is the squad then in the next gen? How many, how many sort of contenders are in there? Would you say? So we've got like seven people total in the, in, on the pipe team right now. And uh, I'm not exactly sure if there's anyone younger than that coming up, but I'm sure we're going to find some talent in there and they're going to it, do well. It amazes me in some ways that there isn't more of, of, of the representation in, in, from Canada in the half pipe because you've got a pretty solid pedigree of, you know, Michael Chuck and some other guys from back in the day just sending it. Like, yeah. and the, the talent in, I, I was mentioning, I can't remember who it was too. Like, I remember going to Whistler for the first time and seeing guys ride and just be like, oh, they're, they're, they're the best snowboarders I've ever seen. And they were just like yeah. average Joe in the park. And they're like, oh, they're not even sponsored. And then the next level would show up and I'm like, but that's the best guy I've ever seen. Well, like, that's the best <laughs> girl I've ever seen. And they're like, oh, they're just, you know, they work in a pizza joint then. And I was like, what is yeah. going on here? Like, it's, it's, crazy how, how deep the talent pool is and but people just want to shred for fun do you think yeah i think if you go to any resort though you're gonna find those guys they might have like hookups but they're not like on the tour and they're not well known but they rip that park so hard because they're riding it every day and they just want to ride every single day you're gonna find that anywhere you go but um in terms of like half pipe man like i don't know i I think there's just um, a disconnect like re after the, uh, the Vancouver games, I think kind of is when it started where, I don't know, maybe it was the recession maybe that where like people were getting tighter on budgets. We started losing a lot of half pipes around Canada. Like when I grew up, there was just in my like vicinity of like a 20 minute drive of all these really small resorts, there was five half pipes. So yeah, okay. everyone grew up riding half pipe and there was so many small local events. And then they started like getting less and slope style became more popular and it was cheaper and easier to ride. And I wouldn't say easier to learn, but like there was just more opportunity. Right. Um, and for some reason, I think like people there were like at least when with the build of the 22 foot half pipe you needed to be so on point with like building a good half pipe and maintaining it that a lot of people didn't understand that so a lot of the half pipes went to shit and a lot of people stopped riding them and now we actually have good funding over the last like i'd say six years um canada snowboard and freestyle ski canada have been putting in a lot of money into building the half pipe in calgary and making it better and they get frank wells who's one of the best builders in the world to come in and train the local guys and build it with them. And he comes back in like multiple times a year to shape it and get it good for contests and whatnot as well. So um, I think that's a big difference and why we're seeing all these, like all these young kids around the same age that are coming up in Calgary because they have that really good half pipe and they have a good program out there. Well, that's good. Well, hopefully, uh, with you flying the flag at the top of the top of the tier, we're going to see loads of uh, young rippers coming up. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's the plan anyway. And for anyone out there listening or watching, you can help out. You can go on the Canada team snowball page, Canada snowboard.ca. There's t-shirts, there's toques, there's everything you can go and buy and all those dollars go towards stuff like this. And you can also donate. Very important. There's a donate tab and you can uh, get a charitable tax receipt and you can actually choose where all, where your money, where your donation goes. So, 
hopefully a few more dollars flying in. We'll get a few more pipes and we'll get some, uh, some uh, more young rippers to, to back up Derek. Yeah, even um, a little bit bulbs. Yeah. Um, Derek, it's been great. Thank you so much for, for your time. Um, yeah, I'm going to leave you to what, one more day of quarantine. Yeah, one more day and then I'm a free man. Straight, straight to the dog and the lady. <laughs> Yeah, Who gets exactly. the first hug? Who gets the first hug? Your lady or your dog? The lady gets the first hug and then the dog gets second. Well, it really depends on who comes to me first, you know? If, like, <laughs> Covering I walk in the door and the dog comes running, he's getting it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Derek, enjoy your last hours of uh, confinement. Thanks so much for joining us. Big shout out to Skullcandy for helping make this happen. Derek, we'll see you soon.